Now, NDE Radio, a weekly exploration of near-death experiences and similar encounters with the other side. Now, here's your host, Lee Whitting. Welcome to NDE Radio with Lee Whitting. Whether you're listening on TalkZone, by podcast, through the archives of our ad-free shows on our YouTube channel, or connected through the incredible content of our Facebook page. Today is Christmas Day, 2023, and it reminded me of Charles Dickens' story, A Christmas Carol, as it does every year this time. Well, who could avoid it, with all the filmed versions of Dickens' story being aired again on television? It's an honor Dickens deserves, since it was his writing of The Christmas Carol that almost single-handedly changed the way the British and America came to observe Christmas. Dickens was writing during the Industrial Age in England when people were moving to the city and leaving their traditions. Gifts were given on Boxing Day, but some religions, such as the Puritans, even considered Christmas more pagan than Christian. Father Christmas was a character more like the pagan green man, bringing joy to the dark time of the year. But before Dickens' tale was published on December 19, 1843, The tradition of celebrating Jesus' birthday was dying out in England. Dickens and Washington Irving had met and agreed that the reestablishment of a celebrational tradition of Christmas might be good for their industrial age. But it was Dickens who emphasized the notion that Jesus' birth was best celebrated in Jesus' teaching to meet the needs of one another. In a New Year's show on NDE Radio I recorded back in 2017, I mentioned that Dickens experienced a vision of Mary, Jesus' mother, and described it in a letter to a friend. He called it a dream, though it seemed far more powerful, a truly spiritually transformative experience. And who more appropriate a spokesman from the other side to encourage the celebration of Jesus' birthday than the mother who birthed him? In an article titled, The Night Dickens Had a Marian Vision, which appeared in the Catholic Herald, William Otte, author of Dickens and Carlyle, The Question of Influence, provided the text of a letter Dickens wrote to John Foster. Otte wrote, It seems Dickens, in 1844, underwent a religious experience rarely written about, which he described vividly in a letter to Forster. Let me tell you, he wrote from Venice, of a curious dream I had last Monday night and of the fragments of reality I can collect, which helped to make it up. In an indistinct place, which was quite sublime in its indistinctness, I was visited by a spirit. I could not make out the face, nor do I recollect that I desired to do so. It wore a blue drapery, as the Madonna might in a picture by Raphael, and bore no resemblance to anyone I have had known except in stature. It was so full of compassion and sorrow for me that it cut me to the heart. And I said, sobbing, Oh, give me some token that you have really visited me. Answer me one question. I said in an agony of entreaty, lest it should leave me. What is the true religion? As it paused a moment without replying, I said, Good God, in such an agony of haste, lest it should go away, you think, as I do, that the form of religion does not so greatly matter if we try to do good? Or, I said, observing that it still hesitated and was moved with the greatest compassion for me, perhaps the Roman Catholic is the best? Perhaps it makes one think of God oftener and believe in him more steadily? For you, said the Spirit full of such heavenly tenderness for me that I felt as if my heart would break. For you, it is the best. Then I awoke with the tears running down my face and myself in exactly the condition of the dream. It was just dawn. During the course of the dream, Dickens at first made the assumption that he was speaking to his wife's sister, Mary Hogarth, who had died in 1837. But then he perceived that the spirit bore no resemblance to anyone I have known, but the name Mary perhaps gave a clue. Dickens' reference to Forster, his wish to leave in his writings, his hand upon the time, with one tender touch, 
for the mass of toiling people that nothing could obliterate being fully by any agents by being fulfilled by any agency in which I had no hand. So was it the blessed Virgin that fulfilled that wish empowering Dickens writing of a Christmas Carol to serve the mass of toiling people? Personally, I love the thought that Mary had a hand in applauding Charles Dickens writing of a Christmas Carol a book so significant that it reawoke the world's celebration of the birth of Mary's son. Generally speaking, most of the theatrical dialogues follow Dickens' writing pretty closely, and the ghostly scenes created by special effects teams over the years keep people fascinated. More relevant to Andy ears, though, is that the story of Scrooge is one of an extended life review, a visit with the light of love, and a preview of what may happen if Scrooge doesn't repent for his greed and heartlessness. And I thought it worth repeating once again Dickens' own descriptions of Scrooge's visions, especially since Charles Dickens had an approving vision, a blessing from Mary right after A Christmas Carol was published. On Christmas Eve, Scrooge first encounters a vision of his deceased business partner, Marley. Just as dying people often first encounter a departed loved one or friend coming to meet them. Marley does not bring good news, however, but a warning. If Scrooge does not reform his ways, he'll wind up a suffering ghost just like Marley is. Following Marley's warning comes visits uh, from three spirits who review Scrooge's life with him, past, present, and future and show how his greed and selfishness were forging change, chains of punishment for him to wear on the other side. Here's how Dickens writes of Marley. The same face, the very same. Marley in his pigtail, usual waistcoat, tights and boots, the tassels on the ladder bristling like his pigtail, and his coat skirts and the hair upon his head. The chain he drew was clasped about his middle. It was long and wound about him like a tail, and it was made, for Scrooge observed it closely, of cash boxes, keys, padlocks, ledgers, deeds, and heavy purses wrought in steel. His body was transparent so that Scrooge, observing him and looking through his waistcoat, could see the two buttons on his coat behind. How now, said Scrooge, caustic and cold as ever, what do you want with me? Much, Marley's voice, no doubt about it. To sit staring at those fixed glazed eyes in silence for a moment would play Scrooge felt the very deuce with him. There was something very awful, too, in the specters being provided with an infernal atmosphere of its own. Scrooge could not feel it himself, but this was clearly the case. For though the ghost sat perfectly motionless, its hair and skirts and tassels were still agitated as if by hot vapor from an oven. You see this toothpick, said Scrooge, returning quickly to the charge, for the reason just assigned and wishing, though it were only for a second, to divert the vision's stony, stony gaze from himself. I do, replied the ghost. You are not looking at it, said Scrooge. But I see it, said the ghost, notwithstanding. Well, returned Scrooge, I have but to swallow this and, and be for the rest of my days persecuted by a legion of goblins, all of my own creation. Humbug, I tell you, humbug. At this, the spirit raised a frightful cry and shook its chain with such a dismal and appalling noise that Scrooge held on tight as to his chair to save himself from falling in a swoon. But how much greater was his horror when the phantom, taking off the bandage round its head as if it were too warm to wear indoors, its lower jaw dropped down upon its breast. Scrooge fell upon his knees and clasped his hands before his face. Mercy, he said, dreadful apparition, why do you trouble me? Man of the worldly mind, replied the ghost, do you believe in me or not? I do, said Scrooge, I must, 
but why do spirits walk the earth and why do they come to me? It is required of every man, the ghost returned, that the spirit within him should walk abroad among his fellow men and travel far and wide. And if that spirit goes not forth in life, it is condemned to do so after death. It is doomed to wander through the world. Oh, woe is me. And witness what it cannot share, but might have shared on earth and turn to happiness. Again, the specter raised a cry and shook its chains and wrung its shadowy hands. You are fettered, said Scrooge, trembling. Tell me why. I wear the chain I forged in life, replied the ghost. I made it link by link and yard by yard. I girded it on of my own free will, and of my own free will I wore it. It's pattern strange to you? Scrooge trembled more and more. Or would you know, pursued the ghost, the weight and length of the strong coil you bear yourself? It was full as heavy and as long as this seven Christmas eves ago. You have labored on it since. It is a ponderous chain. Scrooge glanced about him on the floor in the expectation of finding himself surrounded by some fifty or sixty fathoms of iron cable, but he could see nothing. Jacob, he said imploringly, old Jacob Marley, tell me more. Speak comfort to me, Jacob. I have none to give, the ghost replied. It comes from other regions, Ebenezer Scrooge, and is conveyed by other ministers to other kinds of men. Nor can I tell you what I would. A very little more is all is permitted to me. I cannot rest. I cannot stay. I cannot linger anywhere. My spirit never walked beyond our counting house. Mark me. In life, my spirit never roved beyond the narrow limits of our money-changing hole. And weary journeys lie before me. Seven years dead, mused Scrooge. And traveling all the time? The whole time, said the ghost, no rest, no peace, incessant torture of remorse. You travel fast, said Scrooge. On the wings of the wind, replied the ghost. You might have got over a great quantity of ground in seven years, said Scrooge. The ghost, on hearing this, set up another cry and clanked its chain so hideously in the dead silence of the night that the ward would have been justified in indicting it for a nuisance. Oh, captive, bound, and double iron, cried the phantom, not to know the ages of incessant labor by immortal creatures, for this earth must pass into eternity before the good of which it is susceptible is all developed. Not to know that any Christian spirit, working kindly in its little sphere, whatever it may be, will find its mortal life too short, for its vast means of usefulness, not to know that no space of regret can make amends for one's life's opportunity misused. Yet such was I, oh, such was I. But you were always a good man of business, Jacob, <laughs> faltered Scrooge, who now began to apply this to himself. Business, cried the ghost, wringing its hands again. Mankind was my business. The common welfare was my business. Charity, mercy, forbearance, and benevolence were all my business. The dealings of my trade were but a drop of water in the comprehensive ocean of my business. It held up its chain at arm's length, as if that were the cause of all its unavailing grief, and flung it heavily upon the ground again. At this time of the rolling year, the specter said, I suffer most. Why did I walk through crowds of fellow beings with my eyes turned down and never raise them to that blessed star which led the wise men to a poor abode? Were there no poor homes to which its light would have conducted me? Scrooge was very much dismayed to hear the specter going on at this rate and began to quake exceedingly. Hear me, cried the ghost. My time is nearly gone. I will, said Scrooge, but don't be hard upon me. Don't be flowery, Jacob. Pray. 
How is it that I appear before you in a shape that you can see? I may not tell. I have sat invisible beside you many and many a day. It was not an agreeable idea. Screw shivered and wiped the perspiration from his brow. That is no light part of my penance, pursued the ghost. I am here tonight to warn you that you have yet a chance and hope of escaping my fate, a chance and hope of my procuring, Ebenezer. The apparition walked backward from him, and at every step it took, the window raised itself a little, so that when the specter reached it, it was wide open. It beckoned Scrooge to approach, which he did, and when they were within two paces of each other, Marley's ghost held up its hand, warning him to come no nearer. Scrooge stopped. Not much, so much in obedience as in surprise and fear, for on the raising of the hand he became sensible of confused noises in the air, incoherent sounds of lamentation and regret, wailings inexpressibly sorrowful and self-accusatory. The specter, after listening for a moment, joined in the mournful dirge and floated out upon the bleak, dark night. Scrooge followed to the window. Desperate in his curiosity, he looked out. The air was filled with phantoms, wandering hither and thither in restless haste and moaning as they went. Every one of them wore chains like Marley's ghost. Some few were linked together. None were free. Many had been personally known to Scrooge in their lives. He had been quite familiar with one old ghost in a white waistcoat with a monstrous iron safe attached to its ankle, who cried piteously at being unable to assist a wretched woman with an infant whom he saw below upon a doorstep. The misery with them all was clearly that they sought to interfere for good in human matters and had lost the power forever. So that was Marley's ghost. Next came the spirit of Christmas past. Dickens writes, It was a strange figure, like a child, yet not so like a child as like an old man, viewed through some supernatural medium which gave him the appearance of having receded from the view and being diminished as a, to a child's proportions. Its hair, which hung about its neck and down its back, was white as if with age, and yet the face had not a wrinkle in it, and the tenderest bloom was on the skin. The arms were very long and muscular, the hands were the same, as if its hold were of uncommon strength. Its legs and feet, most delicately formed, were like those upper members bare. It wore a tunic of the purest white, and round its waist was bound a lustrous belt, the sheen of which was beautiful. It held a branch of fresh green holly in its hand, and, in singular contradiction of that wintry emblem, had its dress trimmed with summer flowers. But the strangest thing about it was that from the crown of its head there sprung a bright, clear jet of light, by which all this was visible, and which was doubtless the occasion of its using, in its duller moments, a great extinguisher for a cap which it now held under its arm. Even this, though, when Scrooge looked at it with increasing steadiness, was not its strangest quality. For as its belt sparkled and glittered now in one part and now in another, and what was light one instant at another time was dark, so the figure itself fluctuated in its distinctness, being now a thing with one arm, now with one leg, now with twenty legs, now a pair of legs without a head, now a head without a body, of which dissolving parts no outline would be visible in the dense gloom wherein they melted away. And in the very wonder of this, it would be itself again, distinct and clear as ever. Are you the spirit, sir, whose coming was foretold to me? asked Scrooge. I am. The voice was soft and gentle, singularly low, as if, instead of being so close beside him, it were at a distance. Who and what are you? Scrooge demanded. I am the ghost of Christmas past. 
long past, inquired Scrooge, observant of its dwarfish stature. No, your past. And here began Scrooge's life review, which begins to change him and over which we'll skip ahead. Shortly following his past life review, Scrooge was invited to join the loving spirit of Christmas present. Come in, exclaimed the ghost, come in and know me better, man. Scrooge entered timidly and hung his head before the spirit. He was not the dogged Scrooge he had been. And though the spirit's eyes were clear and kind, he did not like to meet them. I am the ghost of Christmas present, said the spirit. Look upon me. Scrooge reverently did so. It was clothed in one simple green robe or mantle bordered with white fur. This garment hung so loosely on the figure that its capacious breast was bare, as if disdaining to be warded or concealed by any artifice. Its feet, observable beneath the ample folds of the garment, were also bare, and on its head it wore no other covering than a holly wreath set here and there with shining icicles. Its dark brown curls were long and free, free as its genial face, its sparkling eye, its open hand, its cheery voice, its unconstrained demeanor, and its joyful air. Girded round its middle was an antique scabbard, but no sword was in it, and the ancient sheath was eaten up with rust. Soon they were in the city streets watching the crowds buying food and gifts for Christmas. The ghost of Christmas present sprinkled love on the people they saw from a burning torch he carried. But then the old Scrooge accused the ghost of making people poorer by seeking to give them Sundays off from work. I seek, exclaimed the spirit. Forgive me if I am wrong. It has been done in your name, or at least in that of your family, said Scrooge. There are some upon this earth of yours, returned the spirit, who lay claim to know us and who do their deeds of passion, pride, ill will, hatred, envy, bigotry, and selfishness in our name, who are as strange to us and all our kith and kin as if they had never lived. Remember that and charge their doings on themselves, not us. Scrooge now witnessed his life at present with many scenes of life he could become a part of and support merely by shedding love on others himself. But then the spirit of Christmas present was gone, replaced by the ghost of Christmas yet to come, with a vision of Scrooge's future if he didn't change his ways. Dickens describes this ghost as follows. The phantom slowly, gravely, silently approached. When it came near him, Scrooge bent down upon his knee, for in the very air through which this spirit moved, it seemed to scatter gloom and misery. It was shrouded in a deep black garment, which concealed its head, its face, its form, and left nothing of it visible save one outstretched hand. But for this, it would have been difficult to detach its figure from the night and separate it from the darkness by which it was surrounded. He felt that it was tall and stately when it came beside him, and that its mysterious presence filled him with a solemn dread. He knew no more, for the spirit neither spoke nor moved. I am in the presence of the ghost of Christmas yet to come, said Scrooge. The spirit answered not, but pointed onward with its hand. You are about to show me shadows of the things that have not happened, but will happen in the time before us, Scrooge perused. Is, is that so, spirit? The upper portion of the garment was contracted for an instant in its folds, as if the spirit had inclined its head. That was the only answer he received. Although well used to, go, used to ghostly company by this time, Scrooge feared the silent shape so much that his legs trembled beneath him, and he found that he could hardly stand when he prepared to follow it. The spirit paused a moment as observing his condition and giving him time to recover. 
But Scrooge was all the worse for this. It thrilled him with a vague, uncertain horror to know that behind the dusky shroud there were ghostly eyes intently fixed upon him, while he, though he stretched his own to the utmost, could see nothing but a spectral hand and the one great heap of black. Ghost of the future, he exclaimed, I fear you more than any specter I have seen. But as I know your purpose is to do me good, and as I hope to live to be another man from what I was, I am prepared to bear you company and do it with a thankful heart. Will you not speak to me? It gave him no reply. The hand was pointed straight before them. Lead on, said Scrooge, lead on. The night is waning fast, and it is precious time to me. I know. Lead on, spirit. The phantom moved away as it had come forwards, come toward him. Scrooge followed in the shadow of its dress, which bore him up, he thought, and carried him along as he watched and overheard what people thought of him. Scrooge listened to the dialogues he heard about himself in horror. Here is a sample from some people who stole from his house and took it to the pawn shop while he lay dead on his bed. As they sat grouped around their spoil in the scanty light afforded by the old man's lamp, he viewed them with a de de detestation and disgust which could hardly have been greater, though they had been obscene demons marketing the corpse itself. Ha ha, laughed the same woman, when old Joe produced a flannel bag with money in it, told, to, uh, told out there several gains upon the ground. This is the end of it, you see. He frightened everyone away from him when he was alive to profit us when he was dead. Ha, ha, ha. Scrooge recoiled in terror. for The scene had changed, and now he almost touched a bed a bare, uncurtained bed on which, beneath a ragged sheet, there lay a something covering, covered up which, although it was dumb, announced itself in awful language. The room was very dark, too dark to be observed with any accuracy, though Scrooge glanced around it in obedience to a secret impulse, anxious to know what kind of room it was. A pale light, rising in the outer air, fell straight upon the bed, and on it, plundered and bereft, unwatched, unwept, uncared for, was the body of a man. Scrooge glanced towards the phantom. Its steady hand was pointed to the head. The cover was so carelessly adjusted that the slightest raising of it, the motion of a finger upon Scrooge's part, would have disclosed the face. He thought of it, felt how easy it would be to do, and longed to do it, but had no more power to withdraw the veil than to dismiss the specter at his side. He thought, if this man could be raised up now, what would be his foremost thoughts? Avarice? Hard dealing? Griping cares? They have brought him to a rich end, truly. He lay in the dark, empty house with not a man, a woman, or a child to say that he was kind to me or in this or that, and for the memory of one kind word, I will be kind to him. A cat was tearing at the door, and there was a sound of gnawing rats beneath the hearthstone. What they wanted in the room of death, and why they were so restless and disturbed, Scrooge did not dare to think. Spirit, he said, this is a fearful place. In leaving it, I shall not leave its lesson. Trust me. Let us go. Let, a, let me see some tenderness connected with the death, said Scrooge, or that dark chamber spirit which we just left now will be forever present with me. Spectre, said Scrooge, something informs me that our parting moment is at hand. I know it but I know not how. Tell me what man that was whom we saw lying dead. The ghost of Christmas yet to come conveyed him as before through to a different time, he thought. Indeed, 
There seemed no order in these later visions, save that they were in the future. Into the resorts of businessmen, where but showed him not himself. Instead, the spirit did not stay for anything, but went straight on as to the end just now desired, until besought by Scrooge to tarry for a moment. This court, said Scrooge, through which we hurry now, is where my place of occupation is and has been for a length of time. I see the house. Let me behold what I shall be in days to come. The spirit stopped. The hand was pointed elsewhere. The house is yonder, Scrooge exclaimed. Why do you point away? The inexorable finger underwent no change. Scrooge hastened to the window of his office and looked in. It was an office still, but not his. The furniture was not the same, and the figure in the chair was not himself. The phantom pointed as before. He joined it once again, and wondering why and whither he had gone and accompanied it until they reached an iron gate, he paused to look around before entering. A churchyard, here, then. The wretched man, whose name he had now to learn, lay underneath the ground. It was a worthy place, walled in by houses, overrun by grass and weeds, the growth of vegetation's death, not life, choked up with too much burying, fat with repleted appetite, a worthy place. The spirit stood among the graves and pointed down to one. He advanced towards, towards it, trembling. The phantom was exactly as it had been, but he dreaded that he saw a new meaning in its solemn shape. Before I draw nearer to that stone to which you point, said Scrooge. Answer me one question. Are these the shadows of the things that will be, or are they shadows of things that may be only? Still the ghost pointed downward to the grave by which it stood. Men's courses will foreshadow certain ends to which, if persevered in, they must lead, said Scrooge. But if the courses be departed from, the ends will change. Say it is thus with what you show me. The spirit was immovable as ever. Scrooge crept toward it, trembling as he went, and following the finger, read upon the stone of the neglected grave his own name, Ebenezer Scrooge. Am I that man who lay upon the bed, he cried, on his knees, a finger pointed from the grave to him and back again. Oh, no, spirit. Oh, no, no. The finger still was there. Spirit, he cried, tight clutching at its robe. Hear me, I am not the man I was. I will not be the man I must have been. But for this intercourse, why show me this if I am past all hope? For the first time, the hand appeared to shake. Good spirit, he pursued, as down upon the ground he fell before it. Your nature intercedes for me and pities me. Assure me that I yet may change these shadows you have shown me by an altered life. The kind hand trembled. I will honor Christmas in my heart and try to keep it all the year. I will live in the past, the present, and the future. The spirits of all three shall strive within me. I will not shut out the lessons that they teach. Oh, tell me I may sponge away the writing on this stone. In his agony, he caught the spectral hand. It sought to free itself, but he was strong in his entreaty and detained it. The spirit, stronger yet, repulsed him. Holding up his hands in a last prayer to have his fate reversed, he saw an alteration in the phantom's hood and dress. It shrunk, collapsed, and dwindled down into a bedpost. Of course, we know the story had a happy ending. With a reformed Scrooge helping others with a newfound love and generosity. And the book, A Christmas Carol, went on, perhaps with M Mother Mary's help, to change for the better the world's attitude toward her son's 
birthday celebration. So happy Holy Day wishes from all the folks who make NDE Radio possible, including Chris Whitting and Randy Meyer at Talk Zone, and for NDE Radio associate producer Lilia Samoilo, YouTube manager Ken Root, Facebook manager Dustin Warnke, and host Lee Whitting. Let's keep the Christmas spirit all year through. If you'd like to hear this show again or any of our more than 500 archived ad-free NDE interviews, go to Talk Zone's NDE radio site and hit the Past Shows button, or go to our YouTube channel, NDE Radio with Lee Whitting, where you can subscribe to and comment on the complete NDE radio library. And be sure to check out our NDE Radio Facebook page. Just search NDE Radio with Lee Whitting on your Facebook app. And listen next Monday, 11 a.m. Eastern at Talk Zone for more NDE Radio. I'm your host, Lee Whitting, saying thanks for listening.